Hi everyone. So first of all, I'd like to thank Refine and Ria for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be able to present uh, part of my work. So just before I start, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. So I'm a postdoc in Professor Brett Collins' lab at Univers University of Queensland, IMB. So we're in Australia, Brisbane, so a little map. So we are a structural biology lab, it was a small lab, structural biology lab, interested in studying membrane trafficking process. So just a basic introduction. So yeah, you can see there are so many different types of the membrane trafficking process within the cells. Our lab particularly have a, a strong interest in the endodon trafficking process. And also just a little diagram to show you example of what we think or the structural biologists think about the membrane trafficking process. We think there's a lot of the lot of the protein machinery come together, as you can see, it can divide into a cargo scaffold and cargo adapter that grab the cargo, in this case, a membrane protein or receptor from one destination to another. In this case, and as always, so this interesting in traffic process of how this protein complex traffic cargo from Amazon to either plasma membrane or, or to a TGA network. So within this complex trafficking, uh, endotome trafficking process, uh, process. So one of the particular protein complex, which is uh, sort of play a very important role is the richmer. Now, richmer is a protein complex composed of three subunits, which is small subunit VV29, the long subunit VV35, and another one, the green one is the VV26. So richmer is, uh, is a protein complex that responds for mediating cargo sorting and trafficking from alone to the, as I said, to plasma member or teacher network. Of course, it cannot do this by itself. It's required to traffic cargo, in this case, receptor ion channel, and work together with the uh, different type of the protein together. That's how the trafficking process work. So yes, just a very simple, as I said, just briefly mentioned on the previous slide, that which tumor cannot work on the trafficking process by itself. It requires interacting with multiple different type of proteins. And over the decade of research, uh, we are now able to divide those what we call visual interactor into in two categories in general. So one of them, the first one is sort of the cargo adapters. And mostly they are the sorting next on the PX domain containing protein, including SNCC3, SNCC27, or SNCC1 and 5, which is all 2 and 6, or the SNCC bar proteins. So those are the ones that bind cargo and then bind richmond. So the other one, they are not really a cargo adapter, but they are more like a regular tree protein. For example, the uh, rep seven or the the uh, or the gap or the GTPS activated protein of rep seven, the TB seventy five, for example, or VA, or the the wash complex, the fan twenty or wash complex. They are more like accessory protein or regular tree protein of the richman. So yes, over the years, including our labs, um, a number of research labs have spent significant effort in trying to understand how Richmond interacting with its interactor and using multiple different approach, including extra crystallography or cryo-EM approach. And now over, so over the years now, we are at the stage where I have some understanding how this Richmond actually uh, form complex with other proteins. But of course, they are mostly truncated constructs, so we don't still have the very the full links or the, the full picture of this yet, but still it provides very valuable information at this stage. Now you may want to ask why we want to study the structure of those proteins. And of course the you know, Richmond is highly associated with disease. In particular, the neurodegenerative disease. It has been shown that the proper endosome trafficking process is required for normal brain activities. And the failure of this will like to cause uh, several neurological disorders such as Alzheimer and Parkinson's disease. Just to give an example, it's been shown that one of the mutations in Richmond on BPS 35 subunit, the D622 autogen is highly linked to the Parkinson's disease. And it can show, and more and more study has shown that Richmond, it is potentially is a, 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 a target for both the, um, a target for Alzheimer and Parkinson's disease. But given the importance of this, and it says it's, it's kind of attractive, uh, emerging attractive therapy target. But before we move on, we found that it's, there's very little effort so far being identified 
that the, the, to identify the small molecule that could potentially act as a chemical probe or chaperon of regimen. In other words, we don't want to inhibit regimen. In this case, we want to stabilize it. So which is make the drug discovery process uh, a lot more challenging based on our knowledge. So, so at this square, we actually uh, basically will be the 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 really the so the aim of the project to identify such the chemical probe or the pharmaceutical problem. So, so now we're just talking about this uh, this how we actually start this project. Of course, this the whole project is is actually built based on our previous knowledge of the Richmond from our lab. So, and then, and this is sort of this, uh, we decided instead of going to a small molecule screening, we actually go something different to a cyclic peptide because they are more stable and they have a much higher chance to bind to the protein complex such as Richmond in high affinity. So how are we going to screen uh, those cyclic peptides? Well, I think we actually, uh, our, my supervisor Brad at uh, one stage met Toby in, in, a, in a conference and Toby uh, said at the University of Sydney, they have this uh, very amazing uh, cyclic peptide screening approach called RAP screening. So I'm not an expert in in the the, the, the peptide synthesis, but basically I can only tell you it's a variation of MRI display technique with the integration of the, the flex design, which are in vitro translation system allow it to screen for the, 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 the tight cyclic peptide binder that bind to your target product interest. And in this case, the Richmond. So go over the cycle of Richmond and multiple times, we actually, our uh, Toby managed to identify eight microcycle peptides that bind strongly to to the to to the reachable or based on the um the SPR approach, they sound the initial SPR approach seem to be bind pretty tightly to the to the reachable, and this is how I actually start this project. So I given like, like a, a eight cyclic peptide was uh, was the secret this very little variation between each other. So and as as a lab member, so how I start this project is as uh, and also as a structural biologist, so. The way we work routine is, of course, express and purify protein, and this is the, the probably the, the daily job that we do. And of course, Richmer is a complex, so we want to understand how, and we want to exactly know how strong those cyclopeptide um, bind Richmer. It's so we want to know exactly on which subunit potentially. So to achieve under that question, we first have to express, uh, of course, the full Richmer complex as well as the multiple subcomplex which is either 2635 or 2935, for example, or individual subunit. So there are many, many expressions, uh, a lot of effort. And to confirm, to measure the binding affinity, we use the isothermal titration telemetry technique. So, and to measure the stability, so to measure if any of the cyclic peptide can stabilize the rich, rich in solution, we use the DSF, which is thermal ship assay. And I'll briefly explain it, how those two techniques works for the people who don't know. So for the ITC, I'll show you the diagram on the left. You can see example ITC is, is a measurement of how you can uh, measure you can measure the binding affinity um, um, between the 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 the, the cool component, in this case the richomer as well as the cyclic peptide. And if there's a binding, you can see on the either on the light green curve or the blue curve, you can see a very nice uh, binding, cur uh, binding curve. And then if there's no binding, like a VV26, you will see like a very flat line. That's how we know is a binding or no binding. And the thermal strip, as I said, is, uh, so on, on the right-hand side, it shows that your protein mixed with dye, uh, uh, yeah, the dye, so the dye is a cyber orange dye. So what cyber orange dye do is that it will bind to the hydrophobic residue. So when your protein, in most of case, your hydro, majority of the hydrophobic residue will be hidden inside the protein core. It's only exposed to the surface when they are heated up. And then you can see the fluorescent signal and then you will in, the increase the fluorescent dye to bind to the hydrophobic residue of your protein and increase the fluorescent. So the melting temperature TM is somewhere between the folded and unfolded protein. So we compare that by using apple form, which is the no cyclic peptide with cyclic peptide adder. If there's a shift in temperature, that means they seem to be stabilizing the protein or protein complex in solution. And you can see there's a lot of ITC, but I just don't want to go into detail, but just give you a little summary. Just want to hopefully give you an impression that's really a 
start from the beginning, there's a little effort to, to really to measure the binding affinity and to confirm exactly where they bind and a lot of expression of IC involved. And to give a summary along this eight cyclopeptide, we managed to confirm actually five of them that bind uh, specifically to VPS29 subunit and all bind pretty strong to dinner molar range. And there's another one which is quite unique, it's called RTO4. And this is the one that bind to the, we found it's bind to the 2635 interface. And when we actually go further to measure the, the, the actually the thermal stability, we found this the unique member RTO4 is the one that likely to act as the trap prop of Richmond. The reason is among this, uh, the, the uh, thermal ship screening, we found this is the only one that can actually enhance the, the thermal stability of the Richmond in solution. We think it's because it's likely through because it's binding to the VV2635 interface. Whereas all others almost bind into the to the VV29 subunit. So in other words, it has to be most likely to be the one that binds to the interface in order to, to, to stabilize the ritual, which is we think that's what it is. So and at this stage, so just briefly to introduce you all in the audience here. So and also show the stories as where we get in got kind of interest into the, the mass photometry, the MP. And at the time, this, that, that was the time when we tried to measure the, the thermal stability of the Richmond. And one of the questions we tried to ask ourselves is because whether the improvement of the thermal stability of Richmond triggered by RTO4, is it because whether it is Richmond is actually the result of the high oligomer formation, for example, Richmond diamond. And the reason we have this concern is because um, Richmond is being known when in, in contact of this cargo adapter and then on a membrane, it will form Richmond diamond or oligomer, and which I'll explain in, later on in the, in the slide. But to really address that question, and we, we just want to use something, uh, a technique that we can measure the molecular weight uh, in the absence and the presence of cyclopeptide. It's pretty simple. At the time, that's where we got the MP installed. And then one of the students uh, at the time, Ryan, he was very interested. So that's why I gave him a sample. Uh, this is how he we actually got the first uh, involved with MP. And then the result looks beautiful and amazing. And just show you that in, in the present of the cyclopeptide region must stay in mono, monomeric form, which is 150 kilo dollar, which is the, 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 the mass of the three stuff in the add together. So in the cyclopeptide, the particular RTO4 can, although it can enhance the thermal stability of Richmond, but it's not because that is not because resulting of the high oligomer formation, which is what we wish to get, which is very nice. So no more the cyclopeptide story. So just moving on further, before moving on, we actually want to uh, separate the cyclopeptide into two categories based on their binding. We know the five of them, they bind specifically to VB29, RTO4, exclusive member is belong to one, its own category binding to the 2635 interface. Now the difference of course, it put, is that of course they bind different region. And of course the one bind 29 does not stabilize Richmond and the one RTO4 does. And of course, as a structural biology lab, we want to exactly know how those cyclopeptides um, bind into your protein at molecular level or atomic level. And to do that, we use, of course, uh, the extra crystallography at first, uh, so to give it a try first. And so we, we work on those, the one that bind V29 at the time. And then which call, we, can, we successfully call crystallize all of them, which is very lucky, I would say. And surprisingly, all those five cyclopeptides bind into the same place on VVS 29. And this pocket on BV29 is seen to be highly conserved. So this is very, very surprising. They're all binding to the same pocket. And, and when we look closely, it's, we found that those cyclopeptides all binding to the same pocket using, using something called a PL motif. That's what it's or well, we named the PL motif, the protein and leucine. So when we look at the sequence, although the sequence is very diverse between each cyclopeptide, but they all have the PO motif, this what's called protein, uh, leucine motif, hidden somewhere within the, the cyclopeptide. So you can see how here. And when we mutate this PO motif, especially the leucine of the 
the PMOT, you lose the binding dramatically. Now, when we actually look into the literature further, we found surprisingly those psychopaths actually uh, mimicking some of the endogenous accessory protein that has been previously been, been known and so the structure or is the peptide region or peptide or using the peptide, they found that for example, TB25 and VAR, the knowings of they also bind to the same pocket on BO29 using this PL motif, as well as the bacteria pathogen hydrogen molecule red L. So what we found is surprisingly the cyclopeptide, at least the one in bind 29, it just like mimicking those accessory protein but binding much, much stronger affinities. Well, what about RTO4? Because this is sort of the challenging one and probably the more exciting one. And of course, we are trying a lot of crystallization, uh, some complex, it's been rather difficult. Um, so far, we haven't got any success, but well, we're getting there. Hopefully, we'll get the structure information or high resolution structure information uh, in, in the near future. But at the time, so we thought we were working out, we can try using a single particle cryogen, which is sort of the, the hot topic at the moment. So before we do that, we also do uh, examine more closely how RTO4 binds into regional in solution. And how we do that is actually perform a sort of median throughput metagenesis where we um, resynthesize RTO4 with an attached of biotin attack in front. And reason is we want to use the biotin attack, allow the RTO4 psychopathic to bind to strip everything aggros, and then retromer or the and as the retromer as well the mutant form of retromer can then test the binding and if it's the one with the rest to involve in the binding, we'll lose the binding, we'll, we're not able to capture by the biotinated RTO4 on the resin. And this is exactly what we've shown. And you can see, compared to BB35, Tonina alone, that cannot be captured by the RTO4 resin. And one of the mutants, some of the mutants is not effect, but one of the mutants, D128, when we substitute arginine, we also lose the binding completely. So that's the, what we have in the first bit. At the same time, almost in parallel, we collaborate with uh, Dr. Lauren Jackson's lab at, um, at the Delft University. You, you, uh, and over there, they spent a lot of effort and then solved the single particle cryon structure of Richemer or the native apple form Richemer as well as Richemer in complex with the RTO4. Although I have to say, the resolution is only five, so we cannot detail assign the whether this RTO4 bound to Richmond, but we do see an actual density that actually matching with our metagenesis data in solution. And we can see the actual density on the criteria map is located where this D12A uh, region. And of course, we look closely, it, it makes sense when you substitute arginine, make it residue more bulkier, then you will uh, lose the binding. So potentially this is the, the region where RTO4 binds makes sense so far, but of course we still want to get a higher resolution information or oh, hopefully we'll get there soon. So before I move on, I think the reason I want to explain the slide here is because, and also want to explain why we only can get it to like up to uh, so far five or four point each angel resolution of single particle structure of Richmond. Um, the reason is Richemer is single particle is actually rather challenging as well. The reason is the Richemer is actually capable of form dimer, or we call the dimer of trimer, because Richemer itself is a three sub in the trimer, it can form dimer of that. And that has been shown by, by using the cryo-ET structure of Richemer as well as the BPS5 member and super complex, uh, which is sold by former colleague Natalia and Olesi. I'll explain this in, in, the, uh, in the next few slides, but I just want to highlight that the retrimer itself actually from a dime you can see through the BPS 29 subunit. So one explain this is that it make a problem in solution as well. So as if you change the salt slightly or not, you change the salt of your buffer, then you will actually form a beautiful monomer. You can see start had to see a little bit of dimer formation or even more if it lower the salt enough so that 50 millimole salt, you will see like even the tetramer will form. So this become this cause a problem that is actually suboptimal for high resolution single particle cryo EM. So the way we do that, we actually mutate, design a mutation, which is all collaborate on the same thing, is that we design as a mutation on this the potential original dimer interface. And we substitute those that are allowed to inhibit the dimer formation. And that looks and that will um, kind of the force retromer to stay in the monomeric trimer form 
in solution, even though you change the 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 the, the reduced buffer salt. And when we use the MP again, the mutant form looks beautiful, looks amazingly good. And that is exactly the the sample that was being um um uh, being used to do successfully apply to the single particle quiet EM. So this is what we want to highlight here is because we say MP is a really, really uh, powerful and ideal uh, 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 sort of machine that you can sort of to validate or checking whether your sample um, can be uh, applied to quiet EM or not. Although there are other factors in quiet EM in terms of how you freeze the grid as well. So we're still considering that the MP is actually very ideal. So that's why we show a little example here. So of course, the next, once we know exactly how those cyclic peptides bind into the retromer, and of course we kind of have the structural information, the next thing is actually the important part because we want to know if those cyclic peptides will affect how retromer interacts with its known uh, regulatory protein or cargo adapter, as I mentioned, because retromer is a complex that is known to bind so many proteins. So we want to make sure those cyclic peptides will not hamper the interaction, or at least RTO4. So given that uh, there are so many of them, so I'll just give two examples. One is TB25, one is SNX27. So of course, the way we validate this interaction is using ITC, uh, GSD protein, which is purified recombinant protein, as well as using the advantage of uh, cyclic peptide, and we bioterminate the leg, like those cyclic peptides, and then use the strip everything. And we do the HeLa cell uh, endogenous protein pull down. So this is just the um, figure uh, cut off from my paper, and as you can see, there's a lot of effort. Um, but uh, yeah, so I won't go into detail, but just highlight the particular TB seventy five. So to do that, we use select two cyclopeptide, one in each category. One, of course, RTO four is the solo member. We have to choose that. And then the BBS29 binder, we use so like RTD3 because it is the one of the, the strongest binder to the ritual, so we select that. So I use two examples, TB25 and Snake3, uh, Snake27. So just give you an um, idea of how ritual TB25 interact. So, so previously, we had some partial structural information knowing that TB25 binding to the BBS29, uh, to the ritual, or the BBS29 subunit of ritual, to the BB29 subunit of Richmond through its PL motif, as is shown in the structure here. And what you can ask, yeah, TB, what is TB25? TB25 is a gap, it's a GTBS activating protein of REP7, where um, REP7 is the, 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 is the protein known to able to recruit Richmond to the endosome member. So, um, so, with you interfere the regional TB25 interaction will lead to rep GTP hyperactivation. So when we have the cyclopeptide, RTD3, for example, it's bind very, very strongly to B29. It will compete off TB25, as we show ITC here is showing on the red one, the red curve. So it's no binding. But in the case of RTO4, because it is binding to the uh, 2635 subunit, is what we expect. This um, very no no negative effect on the binding between Richmond TB25. But on top of that, we found actually RTO4 actually enhanced the binding of the two protein. So there's something interesting. And there's something is more obvious when we go to the next protein, which is SNCC27, where this is uh, the work mostly uh, involved with uh, this PhD student charm. So SNCC27 is interesting. So this one, is a, as I said, is a cargo adapter. Is, is the metazoan specific cargo adapter that bind to Richmond through the previous 26 subunit, as you can see, uh, choosing this PDZ domain. So, and essentially it has a PDZ domain and the PX domain in the middle and then the firm domain on the C terminus. So, SNCC27 Richmond is mostly is responsible for recycling of cargo protein from endosome to the cell surface. So, of course, when we try the cyclopeta for RTD3, in this case, we see no negative effect because the binding of B27 is actually quite uh, far away from the 29 or the cyclopeptide that bind 29, so it's no effect. Now, in the case of RTO4, it's the same thing because there's no negative effect, but again, we see this enhanced interaction between the Richmond and Snake 27. 
So this is very, very interesting. So we actually go into the, the further whether then this will lead to a, uh, enhance the binding or the recognition of the cargo or the cargo peptide, because we know sniclinsulin is a cargo adapter. So do that, we use we select as a cargo that's known to bind snake 27 through the PDA domain, which is the PDHR. And we found indeed what is as I expected. <coughs> uh, there's a little there's a complicated IDC curve, but you can see on the blue curve that when you have the cycle RT, uh, uh, RTL4 added, you will see that the binding from is actually jumped from micromolar to nanomolar binding affinity. So indicating that it is likely the cycle of RTL4 stabilized the 2635 subunit of that region, and then that stability enhanced the binding of the SNK27 uh, P that, and then also the cargo or depth that, that attached to it. So, and this also, we also not just done the recombinant protein, but also using the, the, the endogenous protein and using the HeLa cell. Lysate with the biotin the D3L4 as the case, and the result looks consistent as our pull down as ITC, so which is good. So just a little summary of what we've shown here is of course RTD3, of course, it shows specific impact on the subset of the region associated protein, such as TB25 and VARB and Red L are the one that known to bind um, to Richmond through BB29. Of course, RTO flow is what we want, is that it's a stabilizer, and so far we find it does not really hamper or prevent the binding of any its own interactor, which is good. So what is the probably the one of the key um finding we have in the paper will be that the RTO4, apart from the cyclic path that's pretty useful as a tool, the interface or the, the binding surface that RTO4 Find is actually very ideal for the future drug discovery. That region is actually a pretty good uh, uh, a, point, a, a surface for small molecule screenings, if you want, to design a much better uh, uh, Richmond, uh, Richmond stabilizer or the you know, um, uh, chopper of Richmond. It's because that surface, the RTO4 bind, seems to be a very unique spot that's not hamper which more from binding to its interactor, which is very good. But of course, we didn't just uh, do study in solution. We also try to study in the cell. But we know that one of the biggest challenge in cyclopeptide study is that it's very hard to get in the cell. Particularly, cyclopeptide is very easy to get trapped inside the endosome, which has become a problem because we our protein actually is on the surface of the of the, on the on the endosome actually not the inside, so which is make it very difficult. And you can see because mostly because the membrane per, membrane permeability of the paper is 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 highly sequence dependent. So to do that, we actually uh, collaborate with uh, Professor uh, Ron Tisdale's lab also in uh, UK, our university. So in their lab, they, they're using this reversible cell penetration approach where they use the, the bacterial toxin stabilizer to create a pore and allow the cyclopeptide to go in and recover. So this is a very beautiful approach, which is a beautiful chemical approach. And then using this, we can actually see the result quite clearly that this is the RTD3, the one binding to BV29, will actually cause a significant disperse of TB25 localization from endosome. So you can see in the middle, uh, picture here is very nice, where RTL4 has no a major effect on TBC1, TB75 localization, which this makes consistent with our data in solution, which is very nice. And of course, apart from the chemical approach, we also work together with Professor uh, Rob Patton's lab, which is also in IMB UQ, that in their lab, they tried the electrical operation approach to the very similar to what I explained before, but you know, instead of using the strip license, they're using the create the using the electrical operation and get the delivery of this peptide into the cell. And the result is actually quite consistent with what we observe using the chemical treatment. Again, it's just showing that our cyclopeptide can also uh, show the same result within the cell, not just in solutions. And so that's probably much is sort of the 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 the, the part where I start with the cyclopeptide story, but then we actually move on something interesting. It's something that sort of we didn't expect when we actually start working on the cyclopeptide. Is that when we actually 
solve the structure that are known to bind BB29. We found, as I said, many of them that bind 29 within this PL motif. And this actually mimicking some of this already known accessory protein as well. But given there are so many of different ritual interactors, we wonder, are there actually more of those apart from TB25 valve? And to do that, we actually work on this uh, Richmond BVS5 interaction and using the Cotomia Somophilia uh, ritual model as example. And this is something, uh, part of the quality structure or tomogram, uh, um, that uh, this, the quality structure sold by our former colleague Natalia Olesi. And the reason we use this is because we have some interesting follow up and this relate to PMOT, which I'll explain now. So we know in low E. Curati or in East, Richmond is, is known, actually, when it initially discovered, it's actually a pentameric complex. So it's not the trimer as I explained in, in early on, it's actually a pentameric. The reason is, apart from the Richmond core subunit, which is, I said, BB26, BB29, BB35, there are actually two more subunits called SNCC bar, and those specs are we call the BBS5 and BBS17. So they are the containing the banana shape bar domain, as you see on the purple and the pink uh, other four structure. So of course, together they are responsible for uh, traffic of cargo such as uh, uh, vascular hydrolysis receptor. So why is it controversial? Okay, so before so, so it's just a brief diagram, the snake spa belong to this, uh, uh, BPS5 simply belong to the snake spa family. And so far as we know only the BPS5 and 17 bound to the Richmond complex. So what we say is a controversial is because when we solve the structure or not only, or honestly, when they all left solve the structure, it's been shown very clearly is, is the VPS26 that, which is the green one here, that interact directly with the, the VPS5 array on the membrane. Where VPS29 is something that is exposed on the outside Richmond, where this Richmond dimer, the, the arches of Richmond, where is uh, the Richmond dimer. Why is important, as you can see here, the B29 is on the surface and B26 is at the actual one direct contact with BBS5. Because the reason is there are many study, including from the more recent one, keeps suggesting showing that it is the deletion of BBS29, but not BB26 that will completely abolish the interaction with BBS5. So they are thinking the model doesn't match with the data so far. And they even propose a, a different type of model. So it's actually BB29 is on, on, the, on the, the one on the close to the member server that contact with BB5. So what's going on here? Well, this is something we actually done. Actually, when we actually, after we've done the, the cycle fifth story, we actually revisited this project. We found, yes, in, yeah, we found that it's actually the M terminal loop region of BPS5 is the one that capable of binding to BPS29 or BPS35 subcomplex. And consistently in use RTC, we show yes, it is the ratio fifty to hundred of ratio fifty to hundred of that region of the N terminal of VPS five is actually the one that shows strong binding to the region. So it's not the VPS. So it's actually quite also again quite different to the quality structure. So yeah, so why is that? Because when we actually flew into the sequence further. We found within the ratio 50 to 100 of this end of this older loop, there is actually a region called DPL or GLP motif. And that region is actually very similar to the cycle of the RTD3. And if you look at the sequence alignment, that the PL, DPL motif is highly concerned throughout different E species. And yes, when we did more ITC follow up, that makes sense. It's because, first of all, when we use the protein, and we can see interaction. But when we add in the cyclopeptides uh, with this RTD3, we uh, that's been known bind to the BA29 where we lose the binding quite dramatically. And you show, uh, and that's the same thing for we just use BA29 subunit. Of course, and that's what we show here. But when we using a cyclopeptide where the where the key PL motif is mutated, we call the L7E. Then the binding between Richmond and BPS5 binding affinity is restored, indicating that the PL motif on the BPS5 play a role in the interaction with Richmond. And we not just done in solution, we also did the lepizone patting assay, which is to confirm the same thing, that you can see a, an addition of the cyclopeptide D3, we lose 
the Richmond Business 5 interaction only can see BPS5 pellet down on the Forge PSVP laboratory. And not just that, we also see in tubulation, but in the tubulation, the result maybe is a bit unclear. The reason is uh, in the presence of different type of cyclic peptide, we can still see the tubulation. And of course it makes sense in a way because tubulation occur through the BPS5, which is the one containing the PX bar and not the Richmond. So, of course, we then obviously solve the structure. You just have the 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 P or motif part of as a peptide, and then co that with the BB twenty nine, and the structure looks just what we expect to be that where the P or motif binding to the conserved pocket where cyclic peptide bind. And what is this actually end up is what we think is the given model is actually the reason. Uh, also the VPS. Five or BPS5 and 17 snakes are on the membrane surface where BPS26 on top of them. The BPS5 in particular using its internal loop to bind to the, the BPS29 subunit on the on the, the region of apex region. That's how we think this diagram here. And that's why you you mutate this region or you mutate BPS29 or you would lose the binding because this is the the key region involved in the interaction and then it's settled down on the membrane surface to BB26. And that's that data, the, our data is now, it makes sense with all other data published in the past, previously established data. But why we think is actually interesting is because of the next, because it has been shown that the real challenge in the Richmond field is actually the Richmond and the snake spar with the BPS, you can see the, the also log of BPS 517 in human or high eukaryote is the snakes one, two, and five and six. So the interaction in, in this case, in, in metazoans or human is very transient. Um, and there's always been argument whether the two really interact. So it's very different to each. But we still don't know why until our recent finding. It's because we think that PL motif, also is highly conserved in each species, is completely missing in human or the high eukaryotic SNC super alignment here. And that makes sense with IDC. Just using the N terminal region itself, we can see a very nice binding of the N terminal loop region of BBS5 to Richmond, but not the SNX1, SNX1 N terminal loop region, because it's missing the PL motif. That having said that, also is consistent with the Leviton plating assay. In, com in parallel, we can see the, the East Richmond and BBS5 pattern pretty well. And we just never get locked with the Richmond snakes one and five Leviton. So in the presence of membrane, it does not help in this case. So in another state of interaction. So it make structure study very challenging. And to um to solve this question, to solve this problem, then we actually use the concept of the cyclic peptide where we use just a sequence, but we take out the sequence. In this case, we take the RTD one. Uh, of course, it's not cyclic anymore. And we just use the linear sequence attached in front of SNX1 as a tag. And the reason is linear, of course, we can't cycle in this case. We can't make a cyclic form in this case, but also we our study showing is that the, the particularly those one that bind B29, those cyclic peptides still bind to 29, even though they are not cyclic. The linear form will still bind, also the binding for the study weaker, um, but that is actually good enough for us in this case, where we just attach the sequence in front of SNX1 and hopefully they will enhance interaction. And according to IDC, that, that is the case when you attach the cyclic peptide sequence in, as a tag in front of SNX1, as you see a red IDC curve, the binding affinity improve a lot. And of course, that's where we did a little bit of mass photometry. And now we actually, for the first time, able to capture the complex between Richmond and Snakes one using this cyclic peptide as a tag. And you see on the very right hand side, this is the very nice complex. And yes, we are still working on this, uh, the, the, the structure aspect of this complex at this stage. So this allow us to pose, uh, so the binding model is actually, so starting from ease, you can see this PL motif is actually important, uh, not just in high eukaryotic, like TP25, but also in low eukaryotic. Although eukaryotic is much simpler, where you have BPS5 binding to B29, forming a pentameric uh, complex. When it evolve, uh, when it come to high eukaryotic, with the snake spar body interaction is much weaker, much more transient, but instead there are a lot more different peer motif containing protein that bind into Richmond. And you can see another one having 
often explain to that is the fan 21, the tail fan 21, because that's the other one we identified that is also containing PL motif, that band 29, something that, which is similar to VS5. So together, they are surprisingly, there are so many uh, unexpectedly, uh, so many Richmond -hmm interactor that there's no to bind Richmond -hmm through this PP29 subunit and using this PL motif. So this is something we don't expect when we actually work on the psychopathic story in the first place. So just uh, to sum up with what I talked about today, it says initially we identify a group of cyclopeptides that bind entirely to Richmond, and we can categorize in two categories. One is the Richmond stabilizer, which is the solo member RTO4, and other one by specifically to VV29, what we call is a Richmond inhibitor based on the in inhibition to dicyclic TV25 and VAP. Of course, as the Richmond stabilizer uh, part of the group, subgroup, we, we, we know it does not hamper which one to interact with uh, many of this interactor. And we believe those psychopaths together can be used as a valuable tool uh, for example, uh, human cell biology study or structure, structure biology study. And in particular, particular inhibitor category, we also have surprise finding that we actually found highlight the importance of this um, um, VB29 in binding to multiple different accessory proteins through the PL motif. This is something very surprising, including now we know so many of them, and also not just in high eukaryotic, but also in yeast as well. So this PL motif binding mechanism is actually conserved uh, throughout evolution. So something is actually quite um, interesting. So at the end, just acknowledgement, I'd like to thank everyone uh, in, in, my, in our group, as particularly my supervisor, Brad, he always Help and always give a very valuable suggestion, as well as all the collaborator done um, so many different type of uh, help us to solve different kind of problem. We uh, really I'd like to acknowledge them, and of course the all the funding resources in particular we find to give me the opportunity as well as the travel grant allowed to for me to go to a conference. So thank you.